Scotland uh, more than any other government anywhere in the UK. Thank you. That ends general questions. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagements she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's ambitious programme for Scotland, including our plans to protect free school meals in Scotland from the impact of Tory cuts to tax credits. Kezia Dugdale. <clears throat> Today, Audit Scotland published a withering assessment of Scotland's justice system. The people in our courts work tirelessly, but they are being let down by government failures. The report points to budgets slashed, increased delays, performance targets missed, and wasted spending totalling £10 million. When Audit Scotland said her government had cut the Scottish Court Services budget by four times the rate of cuts to central government, does the First Minister think they were wrong? First Minister. Uh, I think they were not comparing like with like, and let me explain exactly what I mean uh, by that. The total funding allocation to the Scottish Court Service in 2010-11 included a substantial capital allocation towards the redevelopment of the Parliament House Court Complex here in Edinburgh. Work on the refurbishment of that project was completed in 2013 and obviously therefore uh, that is reflected in the 2014-15 figures. Uh, the second point I would make is that the government has uh, taken steps to provide additional uh, funding to the court service in response to particular pressure. So in 2014-15 we committed an additional 1.47 million uh, for extra fiscal, judiciary and admin staff to address delays and speed up access to justice. And of course, during the current year, something I would hope Kezia Dugdale would welcome, we have provided a further 2.4 million to ensure the efficient progress of cases involving domestic abuse and sexual offences. And this funding will continue in the next two years. Now, uh, those two amounts of funding I've mentioned, presiding officer, were in-year allocations. So they were additional to the baseline figures in which the Audit Scotland figures were calculated. So I would uh, end where I started. I don't think, uh, to quote these figures as Kezia Dugdale has just done, is fairly comparing like with like. Yes. Kezia Dugdale. Officer, these are Audit Scotland's numbers. They do the numbers, she does the spin on those numbers. And the reality is, is that the budget for the Crown Office has fallen by 14% and the budget for the Court Service by 28%. Even if you count in her comments around capital spending, that's a 12% reduction in revenue and a 17% reduction for the Court Service in particular. But we all know when you put the numbers to one side, we're talking about seven courts across Scotland being closed last year. And we warned the First Minister about the impact of these decisions. And now Audit Scotland confirms our courts are under pressure. The First Minister didn't promise to protect the justice system, though. She did promise to protect the NHS. In fact, in 2011, the First Minister told SNP Conference that patients in Scotland spent 200,000 days in a hospital bed when they didn't need to because the right care wasn't available in the community. At that time, the First Minister rightly said that that was too many. So I ask her today, how many is that number now? First Minister. Well, if she doesn't mind, I'll finish on courts and then I will move on to the health service. It's interesting that she didn't have any real comeback on courts once she had the facts that I'd given her earlier on. Order. She mentioned specifically court closures and it would be interesting just to point out as a matter of fact that Audit Scotland actually doesn't address essentially the issue of court closures but it does confirm that the courts closed were those dealing with relatively low volumes of business. In most instances less than 100 cases a year or those located close to other courts and the court service chief executive himself has said that any attempt to link court closures with increased waiting time simply and I quote muddies uh, the water and he said the current courts have the physical capacity to deal effectively with existing volumes of criminal and civil cases. But, you know, perhaps one of the most interesting points in the Audit Scotland report, and I do welcome the report, and we will study it carefully and we will learn any lessons to be learned from it, but one of the most interesting points in it, I thought, uh, was the observation uh, that one of the issues at play here is the increase in the prosecution of more complex cases involving domestic abuse and sexual offences. And that's because 
there is more proactive detection of these cases and there is increased confidence of victims in reporting these cases. Now, I would have thought that is something that we should welcome uh, and that the opposition should get behind the government in continuing to make sure those cases come to court. Now, I'll go on uh, now to delayed discharges uh, because I have said, and this government has said repeatedly, uh, that getting delayed discharges down um, is one of the key things we can do uh, to reduce pressure on our acute hospitals. That's why uh, I think it is something to be welcomed that the number of bed days lost in July, we saw this in statistics earlier this week, was down by nearly 10,000 since December last year. Now, just to put that into context, presiding officer, that is the equivalent of every single acute medical bed in NHS Highland for an entire month. So yes, presiding officer, still work to do. Of course there is, but real progress being made. Okay, so Dr. Deal. Mr. Deal. President officer, here's, here's the answer the First Minister was looking for in her book. In last year, patients in Scotland spent more than 612,000 days in a hospital bed when they were fit to go home. That means that it has more than trebled under the SNP government since this First Minister admitted that there was something badly wrong. So by any measure, that is unacceptable. That is thousands of patients, the majority of whom are elderly, ready to go back home or into the community, but can't because the extra support they need just isn't there. Now, I don't doubt for a second the First Minister's sincerity when it comes to this issue. She says she wants to tackle the problem. In fact, her Health Secretary in February said she wanted to completely eradicate delayed discharge this year. We welcomed that ambition. So can the First Minister tell us whether her Health Secretary is on track to meet that target? First Minister. Uh, the Health Secretary uh, is working and is on track to eliminate uh, delayed discharges. Let me, let me give her some more. Order. Let me, you know... This is a serious issue, uh, and Labour, having raised it, should Order. To it. In July 2006, uh, there were 1,242 patients delayed Order. over three days. This is important, presiding officer, and I'll, I'll exercise the patience so that we can hear these figures. In July 2006, there were 1,242 patients delayed over three days. In August 2015, that was down to 731 patients delayed over three days. In July 2006, there was 1,055 patients delayed over two weeks. In August 2015, uh, there were 481 oh. delayed oh. over two weeks. But it's not just that, presiding officer. The average length of delay in July 2007 was 52 days. Uh, that by August 2015, had been halved to 23 days. So, yes, there is more work to be done to eliminate delayed discharges, as we have committed to doing. But any reasonable, objective person looking at these figures would know that there has been significant progress made. And lastly, presiding officer, um, Kezia Dugdale, uh, at the outset, I think, of her last question, mentioned the health budget. And in her first question, she was keen to take the word of Audit Scotland as gospel. So let me end with a quote from the Auditor General in October 2014. The Scottish Government has managed to protect the NHS budget. See, there's a trend here, presiding officer. Time and time again, we see the SNP government introduce lots of targets with great fanfare, but then they run for cover when they fail to deliver on them. It was in, it was in deepest winter. It was in deepest winter when Shona Robeson pledged to abolish delayed discharge. Patients in Scotland spent 46,873 days in a hospital bed when they didn't need to be there. And according to figures published this week, that actually increased to 47,797 at the peak of summer. Patients are rightly concerned about what will happen this winter. It's another target set by SNP ministers that they have failed to meet. They are failing on health. They are failing on justice. And we know from recent weeks they are failing on education too. The First Minister says she wants to be judged on her record. Does she really think that this is a record to be proud of? First Minister. Let me, First let me Minister. Just recap. Let me just recap in some of this and let me put it in perhaps a different way if it's easier uh, for Kezia Dugdale. But <laughs> look, 
Order. We think the issue of delayed discharges is hugely important. That's why we've made it such a focus of our efforts. But let me just say Order. again, since 2007, there's been a 52% reduction in delays over four weeks, a 55% reduction in delays over six weeks. The number of delays over three days is down by 50%. Uh, the number of delays uh, over four weeks has been reduced as well. Uh, having delivered the target of zero delays over six weeks, we've progressively toughened that target and we're now focusing on ensuring patients Ms. are discharged Johnson, within 72 hours. So, you know, I don't, for a minute, as long as one patient is delayed in hospital longer than they should be, then we've got more work to do because that is wrong for that patient and it is not doing a service to our National Health Service. But I say again... All of these figures and any reasonable person looking at them would say that we are making considerable progress. 10,000 10, fewer bed days lost uh, in, December, uh, as, uh, in July as compared to December last month. So I'll continue uh, as First Minister uh, with this government on doing the job of improving our public health service. Uh, but I have to say to Kezia Dugdale, presiding officer, if she can't even get to grips with the art of opposition, I don't think she's got much hope of getting into government. Question two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you very much, presiding officer. To ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, no plans in the near future. Ruth Davidson. Dr. Officer, today the Royal Society of Edinburgh published a highly critical paper on the Scottish Government's decision to ban GM crop cultivation. And while there may be a debate about GM crops, the RSE paper concludes that the decision was not taken on the basis of scientific advice and, and I quote, does nothing to enhance Scotland's long-standing reputation for scientific creativity. But more than that, it also warns that it could disadvantage the growth of important Scottish businesses. Reading officer, we know that the First Minister didn't consider anything as trivial as, you know, like science when she made this decision, but the Royal Society is demanding that the Scottish Government publish whatever advice or evidence she did take. Will she? First Minister. Well, we'll consider uh, the report from the Royal Society of Edinburgh carefully and take whatever action we think is required. But let me repeat what I've said previously in this chamber. And... You know, Ke uh, Ruth Davidson, sorry, I'm getting them confused. Uh, Ruth Davidson is, is perfectly entitled to disagree with this, but she should listen to what I've said previously and what I will say again today. Uh, our scientific advisor was consulted on the scientific background Order. that was made available to ministers prior to this decision, but that was not our primary factor in reaching a conclusion. We took the decision we took on GM crops because we wanted to protect our food and drink sector and protect the clean green environment on which the success of that sector depends. Now, the final point I would say uh, to Ruth Davidson is this. There are now 18 countries in Europe who have followed Scotland's lead. Countries including Germany, Hungary, Austria, Latvia, Cyprus, Slovenia, Northern Ireland. Is Ruth Davidson seriously saying that all of these countries are just somehow anti-science? Yeah. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister has just repeated the trope that this ban is to protect the reputation of Scotland's food and drink industry. Yeah. So why is it that the Chief Executive of Scotland Food and Drink said just last month that GM was, and I quote, not an issue, and again I quote, not and never part of Order. the discussion. Ne it was Order. never part of the discussion on Scotland's clean and green reputation. But, presiding officer, this isn't just about GM crops. This is about her approach to government. It is vote chasing, political calculation, and it's not science, it's not industry, and it's not jobs. And in this case, there was no prior consultation with Scotland's scientific community, there was no prior discussion with Scotland's food and drink industry, and there was no consideration whatsoever with Scotland's farming industry. This First Minister has said that she wants to change her government. She wants to change it into some sort of listening government. Well, as well as the Royal Society of Edinburgh, there are more than 30 other scientific, academic and agricultural organisations that are urging her to listen. Will she hear their concerns and review this poorly thought out decision? 
First well, Minister. Can I say to Ruth Davidson, first of all, that the reason uh, GM is not an issue for our food and drink sector is because we're not doing it. Yeah. If we were doing it, it would be an issue for our food and drink sector. Now, Ruth Davidson said that this decision was not about science. I've addressed the science point. She also went on to say it's not about jobs and it's not about industry. Actually, it Order. is everything to do with jobs and it is everything to do with industry. I don't know uh, whether Ruth Davidson is aware of how important the food and drink sector is to this country's economy. It's a £14 billion uh, sector. It employs around 380,000 people when you take into account the entire supply chain. The Bank of Scotland report just in August uh, said that food and drink producers forecast an average turnover growth of 19%. 63% of producers, and this is an important point, said provenance was an important factor for export markets. Uh, so that's why we've taken this decision, to protect that clean, green environment on which the success of this sector is based. And I would say again, if Ruth Davidson thinks that the decision the Scottish Government has taken is so wrong and so against all of the factors she's spoken about, presumably she thinks the same about the 18 other countries that have followed Scotland's lead. John yeah. Scott, briefly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister may be aware of the discussions around the impending removal from Air Hospital of the Stroke Unit of trauma services, of nuclear medicine, of pharmacy services, and also the removal of chemotherapy, of the delivery of chemotherapy services. Given the Scottish Government's stated opposition to the centralisation of hospital services and the need to maintain local access, does she share my concerns and those of my constituents at this and other plans for the downgrading of Air Hospital? Yeah. First Minister. Well, firstly, I agree that services should be in the right place and as close to people as possible. And, you know, I uh, know the member uh, will recall, as all members do, that it was this government, indeed, it was me as Health Secretary that stopped the closure of the accident and emergency department at Air Hospital. Now, he raises important matters. These decisions require to be taken within the context of a national clinical strategy. Uh, and the Health Service would be very happy to meet with him as a local member to discuss these issues in more detail. Question three, Willard Rennie. Uh, to, a, to, ask, to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. Yesterday the Health Minister faced eight questions on Scotland's GP crisis. These were met with such responses like this. A full review within six months. Ongoing discussions. Keep a close eye on those matters. Take a close interest. There is an opportunity to discuss, continue to discuss. Encourage Bob Doris to continue to discuss. <laughs> Isn't it about time to bring an end to the talks about talks about talks and start action to tackle the GP crisis? First Minister. Indeed. So let me run through exactly the action that the government is taking. Uh, as Willie Rennie will recall, in June the Health Secretary announced the Primary Care Development Fund. She announced that that would be expanded to £50 million. Let me uh, run through what that fund is supporting. £20.5 million being invested in the Primary Care Transformation programme, which is allocated uh, to practices to test new ways of working. £6 million on developing digital services, which everybody recognises is important to the transformation of primary care. £16.2 million recruiting 140 new pharmacists that will work directly with GP practices and support the care of patients with long-term conditions. Why is that important, presiding officer? Because it frees up GP time for other patients. Uh, £2.5 million being spent on a GP recruitment and retention programme, uh, £1 million in supporting a leadership programme for GPs, which is developing different ways to equip GPs with the skills that they need uh, to play a leading role in the development of integration work, um, and another £1.25 million for the Scottish School of Primary Care, which is supporting research capacity, which is also very important in terms of reforming and transforming primary care. So I hope Willie Rennie would accept that that's a fairly impressive list of actions. Well, Rennie. Well, we've, we've heard it all before. And nine, no, we have. Order. We've heard it all before. And 99%, she should listen to this, 99% of GPs who knew about the government's plan said it was simply not enough. This week we heard reports, new reports, of problems in Perth 
and in Glasgow. Glasgow GP Lindsay Crawford said there is a GP crisis and she added, crucially this, this has been a long time coming. So can the First Minister tell me when she's going to bring real action forward to put an end to this crisis? First Minister. Well, if Willie Rennie had heard it all before, why did his first question try to pretend that nothing was happening? Now, he also said that GPs say they, they've, they've looked at all this, they've dismissed it and they've said it's not enough. Well, here's exactly what Dr Alan McDevitt, the chair of the BMA's Scottish GP committee, said. I quote, I welcome this funding, which will help in taking forward our vision for the future of general practice in partnership with the Scottish Government. The additional resource will enable us to try out new ways of working that can deliver first-class care for our patients and improve the working lives of GPs. Now, if he'd listened uh, to my statement in the programme for government, he would have heard me talk about the 10 test sites we're taking forward over the next year to look at different ways uh, of delivering primary care so that we are shaping primary care and the renegotiation of the contract is an important part of this. We're shaping primary care so that it is up to meeting the challenges of the future. So by all means, Willie Rennie should get involved in this, but he should actually take the bother of getting involved in the detail. And if he doesn't think it's enough, come up with some ideas rather than just capping from the sidelines. Question four, Roderick Campbell. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to assist research into dementia. First Minister. The Scottish Government remains strongly committed to supporting research into dementia. Uh, the Scottish dementia research community is playing a significant role in the global effort to find a cure or a major disease modifying treatment for one of our foremost public health challenges. The Scottish Government's support includes funding the Scottish Dementia Clinical Research Network to bring dementia clinical trials to Scotland and engaging with third sector organisations such as Alzheimer's Research UK to co-fund research that will improve the understanding of the causes of dementia. Roderick Cam. I thank the First Minister for that answer. According to Dr Matthew Norton, Head of Policy at Alzheimer's Research UK, research has the power to transform lives and our actions now will help determine the future for children born today. So whilst I'm grateful for the First Minister's comments, I wonder if she could advise what further assistance the Scottish Government can provide to progress research in Scotland and indeed internationally into this devastating disease. First Minister. Well, the collaborative research project with Alzheimer's Research UK is progressing well. The Scottish Government currently provides funding of £486,000 a year for the Scottish Dementia Clinical Research Network to provide infrastructure support for clinical dementia studies in Scotland. Uh, more generally, investment through the Chief Scientist Office means that Scottish-based dementia researchers have access to a wide range of research funding opportunities. Uh, the support provided by the Scottish Government will help to maintain our position as a leading centre for research into dementia, and the Scottish Government will continue to do everything we can to support that. Question five, Cara Hilton. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the recent report by Action for Children that one in six foster children in Scotland moves home two or more times a year. First Minister. Well, while Action for Children's research shows that fewer children in foster care in Scotland move homes than elsewhere in the UK, we do know that there is much more to do because we've got to ensure that vulnerable children get a secure and stable home life as quickly as possible. To help ensure that children receive the best possible care in foster arrangements, uh, we are providing over £280,000 last year and this year to fund Foster Line and a range of other support services. And following the closure of the British Association for Adoption and Fostering, I can also confirm that we're providing £75,000 to allow the Adoption and Fostering Alliance in Scotland to take on vital support services. Cara Hilton. Um, can I thank the First Minister for that answer? Does the First Minister share my concern that many areas of Scotland, such as West Lothian and Renfrewshire, are staggering one in three foster children are having to move family two or more times a year? And, and in Fries and Galloway, this rises to one in two. The result is that one in four foster teenagers are living with at least their fourth family and one in 20 are in their 10th placement. Obviously, this has a, detriment, a lasting detrimental impact on children and young people on their behaviour, relationships, educational outcomes and mental health. Given the continuing shortage of foster carers that Scotland faces, what additional steps will the First Minister now take to encourage more people from a wider range of backgrounds to consider fostering and to spread the message that it doesn't matter what your age or gender is or what type of relationship you are in, if you've got a spare room and the ability to stand alongside children and young people to help them recover and offer security, then you should consider being a foster carer. First Minister. Um, 
Yes, I would, I would agree with that and I would uh, commend Cara Hilton for raising this issue because it is an important issue. I mean, it is the case that we should all be judged on how we care for the most vulnerable in our society and children requiring foster care fall into that category and it is one of our uh, most important responsibilities to make sure that they're looked after properly. I mean, I, what I'm about to say is not meant to under uh, play at all the importance of this, but it is probably also appropriate to point out that large variations in the figures are possible and more likely where sample sizes uh, such as those in some of our smaller local authorities are quite small compared with uh, bigger local authorities and you know that's true of local authorities for example like Dumfries and Galloway uh, but nevertheless we know that too many children and young people in care can experience drift and delay which leads to multiple placements. Uh, local authorities work very hard to find suitable foster families uh, for looked after children um, and that is often under very challenging conditions. We support local authorities uh, through the actions we're taking following the foster care review, but we will continue to do that. And I would uh, end by echoing uh, Cara Hilton's uh, comments that there are many people out there who would make excellent foster parents, uh, and I hope uh, those who think that they're in that category would consider seriously becoming one. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I know the First Minister recognises the positive, stable relationships that kinship carers can provide, in particular the Government's £10.1 million allocation announced to bring them into line with foster carers. But can I ask if she will add her voice to those of Midlothian kinship carers, whom I know she has met, that their publication, Through Our Eyes, is circulated particularly to social work departments, to let them see the challenges but also the value of kinship carer, which provides such stable relationships to children which foster children don't often have. First Minister. Oh, yes, I, I, I do agree with all of that. And as Christine Graham will be aware, this government is committed to supporting kinship carers. Uh, indeed, I announced in the programme for government that we'd reached an agreement with COSLA to improve financial support to kinship carers, specifically to provide them with the same level of financial support as foster carers get. We also fund Children's First and Citizens Advice Scotland to provide support and advice to kinship carers across Scotland. And we provided a strategic funding partnership grant uh, over... Uh, 2013 to this year to mentor UK to deliver projects that help break uh, what is often an intergenerational cycle of children becoming looked after and having poorer outcomes. So across all of uh, these issues, uh, supporting foster carers, supporting kinship carers, supporting local authorities uh, who have to find the best care uh, for these vulnerable young people, the Scottish Government will continue to provide whatever support we are able to. Question number six, Liz Smith. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the Scottish Rugby Union about the safety of pupils playing rugby in schools. First Minister. Uh, President Officer, can I firstly take the opportunity to congratulate the Scottish Rugby team on their fantastic win over Japan yesterday. Uh, I'm sure we all wish them the best of luck for the rest of the World Cup. Uh, the Scottish Government has worked closely with the Scottish Rugby Union on safety issues. In May this year, our discussions with medical experts, including Dr James Robson, Chief Medical Officer of the Scottish Rugby Union, resulted in Scotland becoming the first country in the world to introduce standard guidelines for dealing with concussion in sport. Uh, these guidelines provide advice to those involved in grassroots sport, including school sport, to enable them to identify the signs and symptoms of concussion and take appropriate steps. Ms Smith. Uh, could I thank the First Minister for the response? And I think we can all agree that there is a very delicate balance between protecting the players' safety and maintaining the characteristics of the game which made it so popular, particularly yesterday afternoon. However, I'm sure that the First Minister will also agree that the Scottish Government has a role to play to increase the awareness of the medical issues. So could I ask her if her Government will consider taking advice from the United States, where 49 of the 50 states have introduced the Lystead Law, making concussion education compulsory amongst coaches, pupils and parents or for all those who are involved in contact sport. First Minister. Well, of course, I'm very happy to look at that and to uh, let Liz Smith know uh, the outcome of that deliberation. Um, I think she's right, and you know, I, I would commend her for uh, putting it in this way. We want to encourage more young people to get involved in sport, uh, but we have to balance that with ensuring that they're not facing 
unacceptable or disproportionate risks in doing so. Um, I think it is important and I think it is noteworthy that we are the first country in the world to have produced the guidelines that I spoke about. Uh, but I think she is right, which is why I will consider her suggestion, that education about those guidelines is important so that we raise awareness of them. But she may or may not be aware that last year ministers actually wrote to all schools and all governing bodies in Scotland uh, and sent out uh, the youth sport concussion leaflets which contained guidance in recognising concussion and concussion management. So we've not just produced the guidelines, we've taken active steps to make sure there is a wide awareness throughout the country of them. But we will continue to look at what more we can do uh, and I'm happy to write to Liz Smith uh, once I've had a chance to look in detail at her suggestion. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We are now moving to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.